And our first speaker will be Peter Marroy from FCI. He's the Secretary General of FCI and the headquarter of this organization is based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's a person who has really a lot of competence in the factoring business because he was in his former time also uh, managing director at CIT Commercial Service in the US. The chance to have Peter speaking about factoring is the situation that he's the one who has the global view about factoring all over the world. So he's somebody who's talking to the factoring world in the different regions of the globe. And it's very, very interesting for all of us um, to have information what is happening in other regions. Because <laughs> we are living in a global world and we never know um, when some developments which are happening in another part of the world might also affect factoring in our region. So we are happy to see the speech and listen to the speech of uh, Peter Malroy um, talking about the success story of factoring and what will happen. Thank you. Dear distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased and honored to present this presentation on factoring a global success story. Will it continue? At this FCOM conference, I want to thank Roscoe, Federico, and Arnulf for allowing me uh, to present to you today. I want to focus on a few key topics uh, during the next uh, 25 or so minutes, but broadly talk about what happened this past year, where we are today, so are there signs of recovery, and what is in our crystal ball. The past year has been one for the record books. You can see that the industry has grown on a compounded annual basis of approximately 7% uh, annually over the last 20 years. But this is down considerably from 9% last year due to the pandemic and the impact it had on 2020 figures. But looking closely at last year's figures, the 2020 World Factoring Statistics indicates that the industry volume witnessed a period of retraction due to the COVID-19 decline of 6.5%. But looking closer at these figures, the World Factoring Statistics indicates you know, difficulties, and you can see this by region. The last time the industry experienced such a drop in volume was in 2009 during the financial crisis when the industry lost approximately 3% in global volume or approximately 35 billion euros in volume. This decrease in global volume in 2020, however, of nearly 200 billion euros is five times worse than what transpired a decade ago and represents the biggest drop in factoring volume ever recorded since FCI began accumulating the global statistics on our industry over 40 years ago. Now, you can see here another slide which basically shows the factoring industry in comparison to the letter credit, traditional trade industry, and uh, world trade figures. And you can see here in the dark blue and the dark red how factoring has really uh, taken off, especially since the early 2000s in the open account space, uh, uh, achieving approximately 3.3 trillion US dollars in global volume, and that's denominated in euros. Uh, the LC industry is approximately 2.7, 2.8 trillion US dollars. But the obviously the upside potential in the light blue, which shows 
over $18 trillion in uh, open account merchandise trade opportunity. Now here, uh, the total international factory volume also declined last year, but as a percentage of the total, it maintained its position of 19% and domestic volume remained at 81%. One other interesting observation is the rise of non-recourse factoring. If you compare this figure from 2019, the share percentage increased from 42% to 55% in 2020. Once again, the biggest single increase, increase ever reported. Now, another interesting phenomena uh, is a reported reduction in reverse factoring volume in 2020. Most of the largest banks in the United States and in Europe who are engaged in supply chain finance reverse factoring in a meaningful way reported to FCI in some cases double digit growth. One of the few bright spots in our industry last year. However, FCI announced amongst our members that FCI report, uh, report shows a significant decline in 2020, mainly due to a large reduction coming out of China. It is true most supply chain finance programs focus on investment rated credits and their uh, uh, targeted non-investment rated credits um, uh, is increasing. Uh, that's because our members, which are predominantly national banks around the world, tend to drill down uh, into the lower investment rating sector to provide liquidity to SME suppliers in the long tail of the supply chain. And it is well known last year that SMEs suffered far greater than larger corporates during this pandemic. I want to just now show you uh, different how different regions performed uh, in 2020. Europe, of course, the largest contributor, accounts for 68% of the total volume, but they reported a decline of nearly 7%, as you can see last year. One of the largest markets, Germany, fared by far the best reporting flat growth. In fact, actually, the Netherlands reported a 1% increase in 2020. Amazing. The UK, unfortunately, performed the worst uh, with a drop in volume of over 17%, followed by Italy, minus 11%, France, minus 7%, and Spain, by a far better, minus 2%. Now, Asia Pacific represents approximately 26% of the global volume, over a quarter and experienced actually an increase of a little over 1%, one of the few regions to actually show growth in 2020. This was driven by a resilient China. Reported a 7% growth last year. Japan also witnessed an increase slightly less of 3% in 2020. However, most of the other largest markets reported declines. Hong Kong minus 5%, Taiwan minus 12%, but Singapore, Singapore fared the worst with a reporting decline of minus 23%. The Americas, certainly the hardest hit region globally, declined by 30% in total. And in terms of global market share, it declined from 8% in 2019 to 5% in 2020. South and Central America witnessed a staggering decline of 37%, driven by declines in Brazil of minus 59%, Chile minus 20%, Mexico minus 43%, and Colombia minus 28%. However, Peru fared much better with a reported decline of only 2%, minus 2%, I should say. But please note that these figures are reported in euros. And these declines were also driven by a steep depreciation in most of the currencies in Latin America in 2020. North America also was hit hard, showing a minus 23% decline compared to 2019. This was driven in large part by the significant spike in retail bankruptcies and the impact on debtor lines and the retrenchment by the credit insurance sector in the U.S. And last but not least is Africa, which has show, actually shown uh, a growth uh, over the past few years and continued that positive trajectory, trajectory reporting a slight growth uh, in volume in 2020, about 3%. And as you know, South Africa, you can see on the screen, accounts for uh, nearly 80% of all factoring activity in Africa. Now, again, all these figures are once, once again reported in euros uh, and also some of the currencies, including the RAND, uh, did depreciate against the euro rather significantly in 2020. 
So that's even uh, even more impressive uh, performance considering the the depreciation. So, ladies and gentlemen, where are we today, and what are the opportunities and challenges ahead of us? Now, productivity is surging across all sectors of the global economy in the first half of 2021. Uh, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. Uh, but with inflation on the rise, it is only a matter of time that interest rates begin to follow suit. But looking at the chart on the right-hand side, vaccination distribution as a percentage of the population, you can see that the obvious repercussions from this. Recoveries will be curtailed in these markets in comparison to the developed ones. As such, factory figures will be adversely impacted. FCI has onboarded over 150 members just in these past few years, of which nearly 70% of these new members are coming from these emerging countries. Hence, I'm afraid that many, especially some of these newer markets that have recently launched factory will be adversely impacted in the short term. We're also witnessing a significant recovery in the factoring industry. As you can see here, uh, the growth in the first half of 2021, especially in the developed markets, all by quite different from market to market. In continental Europe, uh, the word is quite positive with reports of growth in places like Germany plus 8%, Spain plus 7%, and Italy plus 12%. Even the UK that suffered considerably in 2020 actually grew by 17% in the first half of 2021. In the United States, one factor reported an increase of volume of over 30%, one of the largest. In Russia, the industry association there reported a 15% growth. South Africa, two members of ours reported approximately 17% growth. And in China, the CBA reported an increase of nearly 50% in volume, the China Banking Association. That all being said, the stimulus programs are still having some adverse impact on funds in use in our industry as companies are allured by the lower costs associated with such government assistance, especially in the United Kingdom and in the United States. Now, dilution and fraud risk also increased uh, last year as a result of the pandemic. Past dues, for example, increased by over 160% during the peak of the crisis and dilution increased nearly 40%. Despite these challenges, the industry got through the worst of it, thanks in great part to the government stimulus programs. Combined with the launch of the global vaccination programs earlier this year, we begin to see a significant improvement in these figures. In fact, at such a low, improved levels, I would say never reported before, or at least never the ones that I have never seen in the past 20 years. Now, I wanted just to give you a brief report just from our own platform, Factoring, uh, which shows international factoring volumes. It accounts for only 10% of total cross-border factoring volumes, but it is an indication of where how things are going. So this slide shows uh, for the first eight months ending in August 2021. And as you can see, we took hits in the previous, previous eight months period in 2019 and 20, stemming first from the trade war and secondly from COVID. However, we ended up in 2019 with a small increase of volume. And even though 2020 was a very challenging year, the overall transaction volume for 2020 fell only by 19%. Fortunately, as we see the recovery around the world, including an increase in improvement in commodity prices, which obviously has a direct impact in, in invoice valuations, we are now witnessing a significant rebound in 2021 as well, with a double digit increase in international factory volume reported in the EDI system through the end of August. So where are we heading and what's in our crystal ball? One other stark observation that we gleaned from the FCI member survey was the pre precipitous rise in risk outlook. The negative perception of client risk increased from 12% in 2019 to over 24% in 2020 globally, and 12% to 28% in customer debtor risk in the same period. This is stemming from the end of the fiscal stimulus programs, the end, end of bankruptcy moratoriums, which have not ended in some countries, I might add, certainly the rise in inflation, uh, and, and an expectedly uh, increase in interest rates as well, and stemming from the massive increase in government debts, which 
obviously will will expect a rise in the tax rates or the tax burden and altogether results in increased costs and risks in the system. Now, as we've learned, the Greensill bankruptcy showed all of us what can go wrong when industry bends the rules, manipulates well-founded structures that have been working for over a century, and is a warning sign to those investors and other arms like funds when proper due diligence fails. And the notion of relying on billions of dollars in exposure against a rather unknown credit insurer is another example of carelessness. Let's be honest, Greensill became the darling of Wall Street, businesses, governments, and associations of like. I might add, they were never a member of FCI. They didn't know what they were buying into. Are there other Greensills on the horizon? The UK regulators just sent out a letter to the CEOs of the banks there warning them of concerns they have as it relates to how risk has been analyzed internally, uh, stemming from this and also the commodity fraud cases that came out of Asia, particularly the Hin Leong case. We know that for those who get it right, they are aware what is happening underneath the hood of their car. But for those who do not, they will be subject to operational concentration, dilution, fraud, and many other risks. The other stark observation is the role rating agencies played, similar to 2008, 2009, I might add, placing strong investment ratings on a structure that was essence, a house of cards. My friends, in our rather complex receivable structures, the backing of credit insurance and the backing of these rating agencies is never enough. Now, during the second quarter of 2020, at the height of the pandemic, while U.S. bankruptcies were being reported nearly every week, large retail bankruptcies, I might add, FCI led an initiative to support the creation of a credit insurance shield in the United States to ensure their continued support to our industry. Together with ICISA, we had prepared a joint letter, including the support of the major credit insurers, to promote the formation of a shield there. It was sent to the United States Treasury, the Federal Reserve Bank, and the U.S. Department of Commerce. We received their acknowledgement and interest in the subject. And as you know, credit insurance is a much uh, smaller used product in the U.S. in comparison to Europe. But in part due to the approaching election, elections and let's say, let's be honest, a lack of understanding uh, at the government level, it did not get off the ground. Nevertheless, it was a worthwhile exercise and sets up the concept for the future. By the way, FCI formed in 2016 a joint factoring initiative working group, which was which has met every year uh, since then. And this shield initiative is a direct result of this working group. Now, one of the obvious risks for the factoring industry waiting around the corner is the rise of zombie companies. The stimulus programs in their various forms have protected such companies from COVID-19 related insolvency. Organizations such as the Burn Union and ICISA have predicted a surge in claims in 2022 at the end, uh, as, the, as these uh, stimulus programs end. As, as a S&P report recently indicated, low interest rates have enabled these fragile businesses to accumulate more debt, thus increasing the risks that more of these unprofitable businesses become zombie companies. As such, many of these companies may be unable to repay their obligations as liquidity dries up, resulting in increased provisions by the financial sector, and I might add the factoring community as well. And as interest rates rise, refinancing costs increase, and thus profitability declines for these zombie companies, they'll all be impacted adversely. But on the bright side of all this, kind of negativity is some of the positive advocacy stories. And I'd like to mention a few. FCI partnered with the UNIDWA, so that is part of the United Nations, to help develop a new model law and factoring. This is the first attempt to develop, develop a global UN-based model law for our industry. FCI was instrumental in supporting the model law's creation through an aggressive lobbying effort. And in May 2019, together with the support of the World Bank, the UNIDWA approved the project. We are midway through its development and expected to be launched in 2023. 
this will certainly be a game changer for our industry. And some other advocacy uh, projects. In Nigeria, for example, FCI was invited to attend a Senate Banking Commission on the law in November 2020 on the development of a factoring model law. In fact, they created a draft legislation and it was approved by the full Senate in February 2021. Again, this will be a game changer for Nigeria and the continent, especially if you consider the launch of the African Free Continental Free Trade Agreement, which was launched in January of this year. And by the way, we are organizing the largest trade fair uh, which we will have a factoring component uh, sideline uh, event uh, adjacent to the, the uh, free trade fair conference, which is going to be held on the 15th to the 21st of November in Durban, South Africa, uh, this November. Um, in terms of the uh, 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 Bangladesh Bank, uh, the Bangladesh Bank, which is the central bank of Bangladesh, approved its first policy on international factoring in June 2020. I have to say, this is after nearly 15 years of visits, sensitization training, uh, promotional events, uh, education to the banks and, and uh, non-bank financial institution community there. Uh, and a, finally, after meeting with uh, the deputy governor of the central bank twice in the past uh, three, four years, in fact, he actually came here to Amsterdam along with the delegation, they finally approved this policy in, in a considerable feat, considering uh, they did it at the impact uh, at the height of the pandemic in June of last year. Uh, and you have, to, you have to understand, Bangladesh is an extremely traditional market when it comes to uh, letters of credit and tra traditional trade. Uh, so for them to take this leap of faith and do this was a great, great initiative. And uh, it's going to permit all the banks there to finance against the assignment of export receivables. So we see uh, uh, all the banks now getting into receivables finance, whether it be traditional, international, or even reverse. The other is this legal study, the FCI legal study. Now, the EUF, the European Union Federation, has deployed a, a legal study, I think, in 2014, they went through a second iteration of it in 2017 and again in 2020. So this is the third iteration, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so basically, we also have in the FCI uh, library um, all of the laws related to every factoring community in the world. Uh, but they are, in some cases, um, outdated uh, or, let's say, not fully uh, fully. Um, backed by like let's say the uh, legal law firms and lawyers of our members so what we wanted to do was blow the dust off of them and really do a full legal study in the other 70 countries that fci uh has activities in today so we will we have been working on this i think since uh, may uh and we we will it will complement the euf legal study uh, both studies are free and available, will be free and available to all the members of FCI. So that way they can get uh, studies in uh, nearly 94 countries uh, around the world. So more to follow on this. I expect an announcement uh, by, let's say, the first quarter of 2023, 2022. The last is uh, uh, basically a project that we're doing in China. Uh, uh, FCI is looking at uh, working with the China Banking Association to create a Chinese-based set of rules, emulated after the general rules of international factoring, the GRIF, but basically uh, and specifically for domestic inter-China transactions. And that is because of the, the I mean, from an export uh, perspective, they have either the FCI community or the insurance community, and especially Sandusher in China, to, to take off outside uh, debtor risk uh, outside China. But it, when it comes to inter-China risk, uh, it's it's much more complicating, in fact. And uh, the banks are, in many cases, regionally based. So uh, we thought bringing them together and helping and supporting each other to finance domestic receivables was, the, was of, of great interest to them. Uh, we hope to have this project off the ground sometime by the end of the year. I just want to mention one last thing. FCI announced the launch of Edit Factory 2.0. It's an implementation based on Prince2 and Agile software development principles. Uh, it's nearly at the end of its uh, development and has entered the testing phase. 
FCI will look at implementing uh, phase two of this project in 2022-2023, where we anticipate bringing in a blockchain security component and actual seller, exporter, debtor, importer onboarding capability. Uh, this new system, the first phase, will be uh, rolled out in um, latest by January 2023, and we hope that it will enhance the overall cross-border international factoring experience for all of our members globally. So I just want to basically mention that, you know, because of all of these, let's say, you know, this dramatic and, and challenging environment, we're seeing obviously opportunities, but also a risk. In terms of opportunities, we're hearing across the board and you've seen it, huge increases in volume, double digit in most countries around the world. Uh, we're, we're hearing huge increases in new business. Uh, we're hearing as well significant increase in investments in technology, which is obviously great for CAFCOM and other companies alike. So we think, you know, like ever, after every financial crisis uh, that we've experienced, and I, I, I don't know if you remember, but a year ago I did a study uh, on the effects of these crises in factoring, and uh, we looked at the uh, uh, um, Great Depression in, two, in the 1930s. I went back all the way 100, over 100 years, uh, and also the uh, financial crisis in 2008, 2009, and looked what happened after the, uh, the 10 years after. And in both cases, we saw double-digit increases. So I don't see this as any different, you know, that we're going to see a huge boom in volume, and we're already seeing it. Uh, the 200 billion that we lost last year, it will be regained even this year, I guarantee, and plus some. However, to avoid also the risk that we're seeing, uh, there is going to be a rise in fraud. There's, it's already happening. Uh, we saw it last year. We saw it this year with Green Silk. There, it's more to come. Uh, so we have to focus on sustainable risk profiles. We have to stick to our core products. We need to secure the risks on behalf of our clients. Uh, implementing so, uh, strong operational and technology controls, with which obviously comes back to FCOM, and, and investing in sound technology. What I say as back to basics. So where are we heading? You know, factoring is in high demand right now as the crisis dissipates, as I mentioned, and we see the rebound occurring uh, as reported by many of the members. In fact, you assume that our industry size and all of its components is approximately five trillion U.S. dollars today. That is equivalent to about six percent of global GDP, which is around 84 trillion U.S. dollars. However, we estimate our industry will go grow to over 10 trillion U.S. dollars by 2030 accounting for nearly 10% of global GDT, GDP, which is estimated to be over 100 trillion by then. But this will not come without its challenges with the environment around us still quite in turmoil. However, factoring and receivable finance in general is an extremely resilient industry. And no matter what, I anticipate bright skies for our future ahead. Thank you very much.